Okay, today's session is on the future of healthcare, and in particular, the role of artificial intelligence that will help us tackle some of the challenges we are facing in healthcare organizations across the world. And to help me untangle this topic, I'm joined today by Tom Laurie, who is the National Director for AI, Health and Life Science at Microsoft. Hi, Tom. Bernard, great to be with you today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's such an important topic and so many challenges that, that healthcare organizations are facing. Before we go into the, the content, tell us a little bit more about where are you joining us from today, for example? Well, so I'm based in uh, Seattle, Washington, more specifically the East Side, which is the intergalactic headquarters of Microsoft. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to you today. Uh, it's morning here, and I know it's uh, afternoon in your part of the world. It is, it is. And you've been doing this for Microsoft for a long time. You had a worldwide role before. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you can give us a brief overview of yeah. what yeah, you absolutely. So my, my focus is obviously, as the, the title suggests, uh, advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, specifically applied to health and medicine. So I have the privilege of being a strategic advisor to some of Microsoft's largest health and medical uh, organizations. Mm. Uh, I've been in the role I'm in for about three years, but prior to that, I was on the worldwide team as director of worldwide health. So essentially, uh, today, 90% of my time is spent focused on the Americas and the United States, where uh, prior I was doing the same thing with analytics and AI. Only 90% of my time was focused uh, outside the United States in places like EMEA, uh, Asia Pacific, and a little bit of Latin America. Very good. And congratulations. You've just published a, a book called Hacking Healthcare, How AI and the Intelligence Revolution Will Reboot an Ailing System. So well well done on, on getting this published. This is your second book, right? It is. Uh, my first book uh, was AI in Health, which was more of a primer on, uh, as you know, as AI was starting to become a little more pervasive in health and medicine. It was a basic uh, primer, which came out in March of 2020, right as the pandemic hit. And so the new book, uh, which was published in July, um, it really, really goes beyond that first book to, to look at um, a lot of things from uh, the role of AI in the pandemic to um, you know all of the things we learned and then what lies ahead for how we apply it going forward. Mm. And in in the as the title suggests, you you feel that the the healthcare system is is ailing at the moment. Um, where do you do you see the key challenges? How would you describe the current state of the art in healthcare globally? Well, when we look globally, I think. Um... You know, every uh, geography has a, a different spin on how they do it. So if we look at, you know, where you reside in the UK and NHS, where, uh, you know, in, in your country, um, you know, healthcare is constitutionally guaranteed to all citizens. And so everyone is guaranteed access. And then the question are things like uh, when you need specialty care, what happens when you've got to go into a queue? what happens when it comes to how we treat um, certain types of cancer and, and uh, you know, how effective we are at dealing with that. Here in the United States, uh, we spend more money uh, per capita than any country in the world. And yet when you look at uh, any health measure as uh, you know, looked at by organizations like the Commonwealth Fund that looks at health uh, and, and, you know, all these measures across the world, we spend more money than any country in the world. And yet our health status is, um, you know, lower than most other developed nations. And so we have issues on things like in America, uh, access uh, for all citizens. Um, access usually means if you don't have access, you're not very healthy. Uh, we have a lot of issues when it comes to uh, improving clinical quality. Uh, we've got great uh, caregivers, clinicians, doctors, nurses, and this is pretty much everywhere in the world. And, um, you know, increasingly, um, we're going through an epidemic in its own right, which is clinician burnout. And so our ability to help those clinicians, doctors, nurses, others be better at what they do 
reduce the time it's taking for things like repetitive work activities, those are all part of the promise uh, held by making AI more pervasive as we look at uh, health and medicine around the world. Mm. And you, in, in your book, you look at a few different topic areas like opioids, for example, chronic diseases, mental health, um, a consumer unrest um, and, and access and equality. Do you want to give us a quick overview sure. of what, what some of the challenges are there? Well, yeah, let's start with uh, the one which is, uh, you know, providing care for all generations. And, uh, you know, we'd we'll love to have anyone uh, push back on this. But, you know, for the most part, uh, wherever you are in the world, UK, United States, um, Western Europe, um, we have great health care. Uh, we have great providers. Uh, and yet, interestingly, it seems like when you look at the process, when someone needs to access the system, we treat uh, all consumers and all patients the same way with the process we, we run them through. And yet, if we look very carefully at, um, you know, what individuals need as health consumers and patients, um, I, I always start with the premise that healthcare is generational. So uh, the, the kind of healthcare needs and the way a consumer wants to interact varies by generation. So. You know, you look at like the millennials, uh, they want to uh, be able to have their healthcare consult from the same place they order their dinner, which is their couch. Meanwhile, you have groups like baby boomers who have a very different approach. Uh, they're much more inclined to want to focus on a primary care provider. And, and so as we look at all of this, uh, we have the digital natives, which don't know the old ways of doing things. Everything they do is through their smartphones and smart applications. So. We have the ability to go from that one size fits all in care delivery with these systems and using data and AI to truly personalize it, starting with uh, care that's generational. And then even within each generation, millennials, Gen Zers, we have the ability to allow them to access and manage care on their terms rather than the terms of these traditional health systems. Hmm. Very good. Um, so where does AI come into this today? Where are we with artificial intelligence and machine learning when it comes to healthcare? And where do you see the, the, the biggest promise? And do you have any, any examples of organizations applying AI well to actually make a difference? Sure. Well, you know, when I look at, for example, here in the United States, uh, pretty much every large uh, healthcare organization, provider organization, is beginning to make use of some form of artificial intelligence. So that's the good news. Uh, what we see is uh, it is applied unevenly, but for the most part, um, you know, it is being used. Uh, I always like to just make sure everyone uh, recognizes that we're all early in the journey of how we're going to take artificial intelligence and actually make healthcare better as, as we learn how to apply it. But in these early days, um, most of what's being done when people say they're making use of artificial intelligence, what that usually means is they're making use of some form of machine learning, which is they're trying to predict things. So uh, a quick example would be uh, there's a health system um, that I'm working with that um, is, is looking at, you know, how to predict everything from um, emergency department volumes to be able to better get a handle on staffing and, and the way of triaging things to, um, you know, predicting which treatments, if you're a, a woman with a malignant breast lump and there are four treatment options, uh, which one is the best choice for that individual? Um, we're doing a number of other things or seeing a number of other things when it comes to uh, not replacing the decisions of doctors, but augmenting uh, by giving them more information to suggest a treatment path, uh, which then allows them to have more information as they make their own decisions as humans on, on which way to go. So it's a lot of machine learning predicting. Uh, we're seeing um, better use being made of things like natural language processing. So in one example, um, with a very large academic medical center, uh, they've done something simple but elegant where you will think about uh, you are sent off to have an image of some sort done, a, a MRI, a CT scan, or just a garden variety image. 
uh, once that image is done, uh, a radiologist does a radiology read. And so typically they're looking for one thing, which is the reason by which you had that image done. But many times in the background, as they're looking to do that read, there's something else that can be seen. So as uh, radiologists are dictating, uh, natural language processes is, is being used to call out these secondary issues for follow-up, where previously those things might go uh, unnoticed or uh, no follow-up. And in the case of this very large academic medical center, uh, they're getting about uh, 100 secondary diagnoses each day which means there's follow-up and the consumer is being told, hey, we, we sent you to uh, have this image for this one reason, but we've seen something else we wanna bring you back and, and look more into. So it's a preventive way of really, um, you know, trying to get out ahead of a future health problem. I, I've got many more, but let me stop there. Yeah, they're, they're all great examples of, of making this whole process more efficient and and more and really getting the best out of out of people and the best out of the ais because as humans there are always biases that we bring to the table as you say if if my job is to diagnose a a certain condition this is what i'm focused on and i will probably miss some of the secondary findings that that could be seen but an ai can look at everything um we we've had lots of promises i think like all the the hype technology um you go through these hype cycles and especially in healthcare we, we've now talked about this for so many years that that ais can analyze ct scans that they can give us treatment options and weigh them up and predict this and they can predict um health outcomes they can predict um the the demand of of ers and so on um why are we not there yet why are we not using it really effectively in all healthcare organizations great question and how many hours do we have for this session <laughs> as um, long as you want <laughs> no, it, it is truly uh at the heart of the dialogue in so many cases where um you know, to answer that question, I bring us back to, uh, I, I did a piece for um, Forbes a while back where they asked me to write a piece on uh, the good news about the pandemic or what we learned. And so, so the title of the article is, we interrupt this pandemic to bring you some good news. So one of the things we learned uh, in the pandemic is that, an, uh, you know, a, a health system, um, which typically in any country is known for moving at glacial speed uh, suddenly was able to move at warp speed when it came to facing a big challenge and, and, and having to, you know, make changes, look at how they worked and, and change those work processes to keep up with the health threat of the pandemic. So uh, the premise to me is very simple. If we could go fast when we had this global pandemic, let's take what we learned and do the same thing when it comes to attacking other problems, such as what you mentioned earlier, the opioid crisis, uh, chronic disease management. And, you know, typically, uh, what is it that's stopping us? Uh, it's not the technology. Uh, the technology, frankly, is getting out ahead of how humans are looking at how to use it across all industry. Uh, a lot of times it comes down to what I call the leadership imperative, where, um, you know, you have many organizations that have leaders that are uh, used to running things a certain way. You have your processes for clinical workflow. And sometimes it's hard to recognize, um, you know, what you're doing and how to change that to go faster or be better. Mm -hmm. So, so much of it's not the technology, it's really leaders, clinical um, NHS leaders in your case, uh, really understanding the capabilities of AI today. And then too, looking at uh, how to apply it to add value. And, and as you, I'm sure know, uh, value from AI doesn't come from the technology. It comes from changing clinical workflows, operational workflow processes. And so if there's anything that your listeners would remember about this session, it comes down to this. AI adds value in only one or two ways. It adds value by automating the way work is done or augmenting the way work is done. Automation means work done by a human today is going to be done by a smart machine today or in the future. 
this is where highly repetitive work activities of any job is going to be automated. But the biggest part of healthcare today is augmentation because most of what everything uh, the people do, I mean, they're all knowledge workers. So the idea of augmentation is how do we bring AI in behind the humans to make them better at something they care about? So if you're a doctor and, and you're a specialist, is how do we make you better? Better means uh, you have better outcomes, you have higher quality. Better also means things like we're reducing those repetitive work activities to give you more time back to do things like spend more time with the patient or more time doing research. So it's all those things, but AI is, is a driver of process change. And anyone who recognizes that and starts down that journey is going to drive value at scale in healthcare. So when you, you said that one of the key challenges is to actually have this awareness uh, across senior leaders in the healthcare space to understand the power of AI. And, and uh, this is something I, I see really across all industries, and um, but in healthcare in particular, because people that I, I find the people that, that are in healthcare are not necessarily people that that are passionate about data and, and technology. They're there for for reasons of providing care to to people, and there's a cultural challenge here, don't you think? Absolutely, and and uh, which is not to take away anything from those leaders as much as to say mm. the dynamics are very different, and you probably see this uh, all the time because you're looking across multiple industry. And it's funny to me, um, again, I, I get to serve as an advisor to uh, a lot of very prestigious uh, organizations with some of the smartest people on the planet. And what's interesting to me is I'll be working with a clinical leader or a healthcare exec that's highly accomplished. I mean, you don't get through medical school <laughs> by being of average intelligence. Uh, mm. I don't think you do. <laughs> um, but these are highly trained, uh, highly successful people. And yet somehow there's almost this inferiority complex. When you start talking about AI and data, they kind of pull back and, and do the, oh, I don't know anything about that. Or they will they will hand that off to say, well, I'm, I'm the NHS executive, or I'm the health system executive, or I'm the clinical director of something. Uh, and they push that off to the chief information officer, the chief technology officer. And, What's so important is to recognize the importance of roles like CIOs and CTOs, but um, back to that leadership imperative, the role of the senior uh, people as clinical leaders, as health leaders, to really understand their role, their part of driving uh, cultural awareness, education, and process change. They are at the heart of driving value, and yet so many times, when you mention AI, they will say, well, that's a technical thing and it goes to this group. And you know, I always like to, to, to point out that um, I, I do classes for health executives and clinical leaders uh, on this where they don't have to understand how AI works. What they have to understand is what it's capable of doing. And I'd end by saying to anyone listening, it's like to take what I just said, um, how many of you know how all those apps on your smartphone work. And it's a smartphone because somewhere in the background is using data and AI. And, you know, people rarely stop to think about how an application they're using works. Instead, they look at how to apply it to do something they care about. We, we need senior health leaders to be doing the same. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, how do they do this? Do you have a have an example of an organization that has improved what I call the digital literacy of, of their, their senior leadership team? Well, you know, we see pockets around the world. We, some are doing better than others. And again, back to the United States, every major health system in the United States is making some use of AI. But um, you know, it, it's really in the approach that I think is going to create winners and losers. So uh, in my first book, I, I teed up, um, you know, examples of what I call traditional health systems versus intelligent health systems. So both are making use of AI. Traditional health systems have leaders basically saying, how do we use AI to take what we're doing, the processes by which we're doing them, and just make that more efficient? 
So if I have the ability to use AI to say, uh, make a process go faster or be able to get 10 more patients into that hospital per day, that's an example of, of using AI to make current systems more efficient. On the other hand, intelligent systems, uh, health systems, which can be a hospital, it can be a public health division, it can be anyone, they're basically saying AI gives us the ability to rethink fundamentally how we're doing everything. So this is where we have leaders that understand um, the capabilities of AI without necessarily knowing how it works. And what they're doing, they are the experts at the processes in that hospital, in that public health division. And they're using it to rethink and redeploy uh, all things across all patient experiences and all channels. And, and basically they're looking at redoing how it works rather than just making it more efficient. And, and so we see both making progress, but I believe going forward, particularly when you look at what I believe uh, consumers today, particularly health consumers of the future want, it's that intelligent health system and that approach of saying, how do I make it better? How do I personalize that experience that's going to win out over the next few years? Very good. So for anyone who wants to understand the 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 current state of the art of AI in healthcare and say what capabilities do AI systems have today that maybe didn't exist five years ago, you you see this all the time, some leading edge applications. What would you highlight there in terms of AI capabilities and, and do you have any examples? Well, yeah, again, it's amazing to me how uh, almost on a quarterly basis, we're reaching human parity with so many things in AI, vision, speech, knowledge, extraction, to name a few. And human parity means um, it's as good as an average human being and whatever it's doing. So once again, understanding <clears throat> what the capabilities are, and then as the expert at understanding a clinical workflow process. So you're the director of, of surgical services. You are the, you know, you're the head of home health. Uh, you're the expert at the processes. You know what could be done better. You're a health consumer. Uh, I mean, it'd be interesting if we did a um, somehow a focus group of a representative group of, of health consumers in the UK, and just got them talking about how the system could better serve them. So you, you have people who know what needs to be made better. Uh, armed with uh, some of these new tools, you have the ability to change those processes. So one quick example, I'll, I'll actually go out to Singapore. So, you know, everyone's talking about population health, which um, is always interesting because I always like to say, well, what does that mean? But when you look at managing the health of a population such as diabetics, um, the government of Singapore is doing some interesting work uh, where they're making use of machine learning, deep algorithms, and then uh, applying that uh, with something else called advanced nudge theory. So they've taken, uh, they've mined data for uh, citizens and they've got about 5 million citizens and they've been able to identify which citizens are pre-diabetic, number one. They, they then are using uh, the algorithms and nudge theory uh, for those citizens who sign up for volunteer to be part of a program where they're getting uh, highly personalized daily nudges on what they should be doing for their health. And, and by highly personalized, it's not anything, it, it goes far beyond what an Apple Watch would do for you today because it's based on uh, everything about you, what's happening to you right now, and then predicting how that will go. So in doing this, the early results show they're actually able to slow the progression from pre-diabetic to diabetic. So think about that for a moment. If you're that citizen and, and you can slow the progress of going, you know, once you cross over to being fully diabetic, that's pretty much a lifelong issue. If you're the government, um, not only are you keeping citizens healthy, but you know once a citizen crosses over from pre-diabetic to diabetic and you are the provider and payer of all health services, you know the cost of managing that every year for as long as that person's on this planet goes way up. So, so the ability to bring all that together, be proactive 
um, to engage citizens in their own health when they choose to do it, I think is a great example of bringing together artificial intelligence, other things like uh, nudge theory. And then it's almost creating this partnership between these big health entities and the consumers they're trying to serve. Very good. I love that example. Um, another topic whenever you talk about AI in any setting, but especially in healthcare, is that you, you said that it, it will impact the work in two different ways. It will automate parts and will augment others. That induces some fear in, in lots of people saying, okay, what does it mean? Will my job be automated? If it's not going to be automated, how will it be augmented? And what will this mean for my my skills that I need? Um, so how, how will AI augment the role of healthcare workers? <clears throat> and do you have any recommendations in terms of skills they should be focusing on? Should they focus on data science and AI skills and supplement this and, and or should they focus on other skills? So how yeah. will it augment the, the, the work and well, what this mean for skills? Yeah, yeah. If, if we start with the premise that uh, the majority of people in health and medicine today are knowledge workers, um, and, you know, and, and Again, we have these dialogues all the time. Uh, rest assured, anyone who is a good knowledge worker, it's uh, less about, will you have a job and more about how will that job, how will that work be different in the future? And, and some of this, Bernard, gets down to, um, you know, understanding the fundamentals of what uh, AI is good at and frankly, what um, humans are better at and will be for, I think, a long time. So when, when you look at something like uh, what artificial intelligence is good at, it's good at things like pattern recognition. It's great at sifting through massive amounts of data to find something that humans either aren't capable of finding or would take years. Humans, on the other hand, are uh, really great at things like um, wisdom, common sense, uh, empathy, creativity, all of which, when you think about the care process or any work process, uh, is vitally important. And in, in the class I teach, um, and I actually have an example in the book where if, if you just look at what AI can do in machine learning, um, that on its own is never going to replace humans when it comes to the care process. So the example I use is give me data, give me tools, and I can correlate virtually anything. So in, in the book, I think I use the example of, uh, I can find a perfect correlation between per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. <laughs> so, so the question is, you know, if, if you step away from the cheese plate tonight, will you save a life? And the answer is probably not. And, and yet to me, it's the heart of um, how do we recognize what AI is really good at how we bring in and behind those human caregivers with all that knowledge and wisdom and experience to, to aid them in taking the skills they have to be better at their job. And, and I know there have been articles still being published in, in prestigious journals about should we stop training radiologists because of AI. And anytime I see that, I, I normally react uh, in two ways. One, Anyone who suggests that doesn't really understand what a radiologist does. And two, they probably don't have a good grasp of the, again, the strengths of AI and, and the things that AI is not going to be good at anytime soon. So back to your question of if you're a, a you know, a provider, you're a clinician, it, it, it is, it starts with that awareness and understanding of the world's changing. These are things you don't have to be an expert at how that you know, neural network works or even what a neural network is, but rather understanding the capabilities of being able to predict something you care about. So if you're a clinician, if you're a chief finance officer in healthcare, I often pose the simple question of start with something as simple as if you could predict three things that make you better at what you do, what would they be? Because therein starts that, that journey of if you could define what it is that would make you better by predicting something, mm -hmm. then you can connect with groups like data scientists and others to start looking at the process and eventually maybe having that prediction 
uh, come in behind you to do whatever you do and, and, and do it better. Mm. Very good. I, I completely agree. This is what I'm seeing that my hope is that bringing in AI will make our jobs even more human and will will value our intrinsically human skills like creativity and empathy and all the things you've just mentioned. And, and because our tools are getting better, our AIs are getting better, they we will be able to democ democratize those tools to some extent and, and use them a bit like we use apps today where we don't need to understand the programming. We can just use them without any coding. Is this what you're seeing too? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, just to put a finer point on what you just said. So here in America, it's interesting. Um, the average physician spends more time uh, in the electronic health record than they do with a patient. So, um, you know, so many of the physicians I work, I mean, they, they, they didn't go to medical school to feel like they'd become uh, data entry clerks. Yeah. So our, our ability to even use AI to make uh, electronic health records uh, more effective is, is truly uh, coming to the forefront, number one. Number two, uh, the organizations like Nuance is a company that uh, makes use of what they call ambient intelligence, which is uh, various components of AI uh, working in the background. So uh, wherever you are in the world, think about when you go to see your primary care doctor and it's not a telehealth visit, what happens? You, you go somewhere, you, 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 know, you park your car, you get off the, the train, you go into the office and eventually you get into a little cubicle when, I don't know what it's like for you, but when my primary care doctor that I've seen for years walks in the room, he looks at me and the only time he really looks me in the eye is when he walks in and says, hi, Tom, why are you here today? After that, what happens? He goes to the corner of the little cubicle, he signs on to his computer, and he spends time asking me questions as he's staring into the computer in the EHR. Once I leave, he'll spend, uh, in America, he'll spend an average of 18 minutes additionally finishing off on that. So Nuance has basically automated that with AI. So when they walk in the room, they start talking, and all of that's being recorded. Um, you know, you can just have a conversation with the patient. Uh, at the end of that, it's going to come up with all those notes. It's going to come up with an initial diagnosis and code. But what's really cool about it is uh, they've got data that shows it's saving an average of seven minutes for a physician per patient encounter, number one. Uh, so imagine seven minutes per encounter and then up times the number of patients they see in a day. Uh, of equal importance is the data shows it's improving the patient experience as the patients see it because they feel like the doctor's actually looking at them, listening to them, instead of hunting and pecking on their keyboard. Mm -hmm. So it's just one example of bringing components together to say, how do we make it better for the physicians? How do we actually improve the experience so that the patients, the consumers are actually the beneficiary as well? Yeah, amazing. That's a, a fantastic example. Um, another big challenge I see is being able to use AI to really scale the the projects. I feel that currently in the healthcare system, um, we see lots of isolated pilot projects going on, um, and they are quite often run by IT teams rather than by by the leadership team of the organization. What do we need to do to really scale AI and make a real difference? Well, again, that comes back to what we've touched on before. That comes back to the leadership imperative. That comes back to creating a data-driven culture. It comes down to um, you know, having a systematic way of having people understand what AI is, uh, how to bring it in behind them, uh, and then it's a culture that embraces change. And, and it's uh, almost comical when I think about what you said, because in my role as an advisor, um, I had the opportunity to go into big healthcare organizations and, you know, the CEO or someone's come back from a conference where they've heard someone like you speak and they say, we're going to do AI. And even if, you know, that person believes that and they come up with a budget and hire some data scientists, uh, and they spin up a use case or two that actually proves value and they get published. 
uh, when I see those organizations, but I don't see them doing the work on the culture, on the education across their medical staff, I can predict with great confidence when I come back to that organization two years from now and ask them how it's going, they're going to be talking about those same two use cases they just got published on today. Doing it at scale uh, really means, um, you know, helping create that culture, that education, uh, work processes to, you know, to, to basically have someone be able to come up with an idea and, and have a catching function and a function that evaluates it. And if it looks like it's going to provide value, uh, really a way of taking that and putting it into production. And, and I, I know that was kind of a very vague answer, but it really comes down to that leadership imperative of, um, you know, there, there are leaders that are going to say, yes, we're embracing AI. They will make the current system a little more efficient. And then there are those who not only really say they're embracing it, but they're using it to accelerate, I believe, the role of leaders, um, even without AI, which is, you know, how do you fundamentally, fundamentally critically evaluate the way you do work, the way you provide services, and look at how to re-engineer that to be better, more efficient, more accessible for all consumers. Yeah, it's interesting that we've been now talking for over half an hour and we've not really mentioned the technology as a key barrier. And this is this is something that that I am seeing. I think the technology is all there. It is very capable. The systems are very advanced. And what is stopping organization are the softer elements. It's the leadership, the culture. Um, you mentioned the need to create a, a, a data-driven culture. What is that and how do you create yeah. it? <clears throat> okay, I'm chuckling again. Um, so um, to me, data is one of those assets that is either not recognized as an asset or very undervalued. So uh, there's something that's been going around the last year or two, who knows how or who started it, but um, in healthcare today, I'm hearing more and more leaders, you know, talk about, um, you know, data, data is the new currency in healthcare. Um, and whenever I hear that, I always like to pose this question. If data is the new currency in healthcare, are you managing your data the same way you're managing your financial assets? And usually when I pose that question to a leader or a group of leaders, there's this long pregnant pause then kind of a smile and then it's, well, let's have the conversation. When you look at any organization, let's take NHS, for example, um, the vast amount of information it has at its fingertips, the vast amount, as we're speaking now, the amount of new data being generated is almost eye-watering as far as the rate and, and the type of data. So our ability to take that data and not just have it be a retrospective record of your, you know, your visit or all of the visits that occurred today, uh, that has tremendous power. Um, it, it, it is the, the truly the way in which we're going to break out of the traditional models we have of, of care today. And yet when I have the conversation about creating what I call a modern data estate, um, people are far less interested in that than talking about AI. And, and maybe you see the, the same in your role, but, you know, I get asked to go out and do keynotes at a lot of big conferences on artificial intelligence. I never had anyone invite me to a major conference to do a keynote on creating a modern data estate, which, as you know, data, AI needs, feeds, and thrives on data. So those who understand and recognize that, those who get that data in order, to be able to uh, use that data on an agile, consistent basis, uh, those are the ones that are going to drive the future. Those are the ones that in my book are going to be very successful. But we have to go beyond what we're doing, which starts many times with leaders recognizing that data is every bit as valuable as many of the other assets they manage very carefully. Very true. And and without, as you said, without data, we wouldn't have AI. So AI is the the fuel, the soil for this new intelligence revolution that that we will hopefully experience in healthcare. 
if you were to summarize your top tips for any healthcare leader saying if you um if you agree with what you said and what i believe in that the the healthcare industry is facing huge challenges that ai and intelligent healthcare systems can really revolutionize the industry make a huge difference by making it cheaper more effective more personalized giving people more equal access to healthcare and so on all the problems that we're facing can be addressed by ai what do they need to do how do they go about creating really intelligent healthcare systems where do they start and what are some of the top tips that you would give anyone to start this journey or continue this journey well i mean simply put um you know it, it's all about humans and process change being aided by the technology i mean essentially think of ai we as humans um you know as beings have become so smart ai is nothing more than we're starting to be able to outsource what our brain uh was was capable of doing to machines so the idea is don't be afraid mm -hmm. don't feel like you have to be that technical expert that you're not but you still have to lean into it so um one of my favorite books uh is by um a leader by the name of kai fu lee uh, former head of google china former microsoft exec wrote a great book called ai superpowers but his latest book is ai 2041 where essentially he looks at the world not just healthcare but the world and how it will have changed 20 years from now because mm -hmm. of ai <clears throat> it's a great book probably 500 plus pages but there's a paragraph in there that caught my eye which is uh, where uh, Kai-Fu Lee says, 20 years from now, 2041, the industry, the world that will have been most changed will be that of healthcare and medicine. So if you're a health leader, uh, whether you've got two years left on your career or 20, recognize that we're going to go through, we're already starting this intelligent health revolution, massive change. So if you're a leader, uh, you get to choose, you know, whether you're going to lean into it or whether you're going to resist. I think resistance, as they say in the sci-fi movies, is futile. And, and so um, be aware. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Um, look at understanding what it can do. Uh, as a clinical leader, you are the smartest person for what you do. Understand what it can do and then how you would bring it in behind you, your team, your division to be better at the things you care about. Very good. And then looking ahead then, what are some of your future hopes or future predictions when you look 10 years, 20 years ahead in the healthcare space? What do you hope for and what, what, what do you see there? Well, I think increasingly we will see, you know, if you look at the midterm, um, you know, increasingly uh, AI will automate and personalize done right um, all of those health and medical services, which means we're freeing up those very talented uh, in short supply uh, knowledge workers to, to be the best at what they do, um, which is not to say we'll need fewer, but rather we'll say we can make them better at the things that they uh, trained for in the first place. Uh, you know, uh, beyond that, uh, we're already seeing it. Uh, it's things like, um, you know, it's what I call care anywhere where, um, AI data, the intelligent cloud is going to allow us instead of having, you know, these things where I'm going to take you and put you in a hospital, you're going to go to home health, you're going to do something that's going to be one continuum. And, and I, I believe, uh, while acute care is always going to be important, it will become um, less the focus, more the focus because of AI and data will be on, you know, how do we manage uh, to optimize your health? Uh, how do we have things like hospitals as the option of last resort, but it's going to be one continuum, one will feed the other. And, and uh, the quick example back to process change is, Look at, uh, look at how telehealth got pulled forward, much of which is being driven by AI today uh, because of the pandemic. I mean, the clinical literature shows that telehealth and telemedicine has been around for 30 years. It's just as effective as 
face-to-face care in many situations. And yet it took a pandemic uh, to really make it become mainstream to allow consumers to try it. We're going to be seeing a lot more of that. 10 years out, uh, I think, um, you know, we're going to have very personalized care. Uh, The technology will have become even more sophisticated. I mean, one of my you know, favorite things is uh, something known as smart dust, which is already around. Uh, so imagine um, a sensing device, a information processing device that's about the size of a grain of sand. So our ability to do things like uh, have that ingested and, and measuring whether it's a procedure or whether that's something that's constantly in your system, monitoring, managing, uh, and then outputting signals, predicting things that are going to keep you on a path of being healthier than you otherwise would. Uh, we always talk about things like quantum computing. I think that's coming. Uh, that's another whole session probably. But you know, the, the power of what we're creating continues to grow. What needs to happen now is the um, you know the application of the expertise of those running health and medical systems, uh, the application of their creativity of what we can do with the creations we have today that will only get more powerful in the future. Very good. Who, anyone who wants to find out about your book, Hacking Healthcare, where do they go? Any major bookseller online or, uh, you know, some stores, but uh, all major booksellers, um, Taylor and Francis is the publisher and uh, it is available. I'm I'm getting a lot of great feedback from uh, Europe and South Africa right now. So, I know there's some out there who are your uh, listeners and viewers that are already buying it. And for that, I, I thank them, but uh, all major booksellers. Very good. Why did you call it hacking health care? Well, it's interesting. When I first proposed that title, one of the people uh, at the publisher said, well, that, that, you know, you maybe you should change that because it's, uh, you know, it, it, you know, for some conjures up, uh, you know, someone, in a dark room doing something nefarious. Uh, in my world, hacking is actually a good thing. It's um, it's something, it's a process to say, let's take some technology and let's just start playing with different ways of doing things. And, and um, you know, to me, it's a very good connotation of you're trying new, you're experimenting with new things to produce a better outcome for something you care about. Very good. And if anyone wants to connect with you, where are the best places to find you? Well, I, I do a lot on LinkedIn uh, for anyone listening um, that, that follows you. Just uh, my name, Tom Laurie, LinkedIn. Um, you know, otherwise, um, you know, anyone who wants to contact me directly, my, my name, Tom Laurie at Microsoft.com. Um, again, it's, it's a collective effort. Uh, there are many people out there toiling in this. We're all early in the journey. And, you know, so much of my book is really telling stories about those on the front lines that are using AI to do good today. Mm. Fantastic. I can't wait to hear more about those stories and see how how this whole field of healthcare will evolve and how we can actually scale some of the, the AI applications to make a real difference. So thank you very much for sharing your, your thoughts today. I found this super interesting. For anyone who wants to re-listen to this, head to my YouTube channel where you can find this conversation and many others, or head to my podcast where you can listen to this and many others. So thank you very much, Tom, for your time today. And thank you very much for anyone listening. Thank you. Thank you.